Thanks for tuning in to this week's message. For more information, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You may be seated. Wow. Wow. Now we've had church. If that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. Thank you, brother. I want to go to God's word. After all, that's where the answers are, amen? Amen. They're going to put it on the screen for you, but we're going to Colossians chapter 1. And what I would really love, and I would ask you to stand, but I won't because we've been standing for a while. But what I would really desire, what I really want you to do is read this with me. I want you to read it with passion. I want you to read it with vigor. I want it to sink from up here to our hearts. Are you ready? Starting in verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Could you put that last slide back up there for me? I want to look at verse 13 one more time. Read it with me. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We've been conveyed. That word means to be transferred, to be carried, to be pulled. To be moved from one place to another by someone else. We're conveyed. And I love the thought of being conveyed because what it brings me back to is something that seems to come up every Sunday. And that is that I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't do the conveying. I was in one place at one point and moved to another. I was conveyed It was all about what he did. Oh, that was a great time to say amen. It's not about what I did. It's about what he did for me. He conveyed me. He he pulled me from the darkness into the light. Isn't that great news? I was in the darkness. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I was in my sins, and I was conveyed into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. As disciples, that is, as people who have decided at some point in our lives to follow Christ and make him Lord of our lives, we're disciples. As disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have committed ourselves for as long as we are on this planet, as long as we are breathing oxygen, we have committed ourselves to the pursuit with vigor with energy, as Paul says in Galatians, and I love this word, with zeal, use that word this week, figure out how to put it in a sentence for somebody, it'll blow their mind. As followers of Christ, as disciples, we are on the pursuit with vigor and zeal this kingdom of heaven that we have been brought into. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah this morning for that. Because we've got to go at this thing with passion. We can't go at it half-heartedly. 
It has to be with zeal and with passion. We, we should be zealous for several things. We should be zealous, number one, for a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, that's not something that I like to take for granted. That's something that I'm going after with passion and zeal. How did I go after my wife? With passion and with zeal. Right? Fellas, she was the one and you had to have her. And you didn't say, well, you know, I'll just work at it a little bit and she'll come around. No, you bought flowers and you sent gifts and chocolates and you called her on the phone a hundred times a day just to tell her how much you loved her and you went after her. So what is your relationship? Where is the zeal for your relationship with Jesus Christ? Am I yelling already this morning? I can't help it. I wore myself out up here. So I figured I might as well just go ahead. Where is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Where's the zeal for, for that? Where, how much time do you spend? How many times do you sit down and say, Jesus, I love you? How many times do you call him every day? We should be zealous for our relationship with Jesus Christ. We should be zealous for the scriptures and applying them to our lives. We should be zealous for that. That should not, as uh, Pastor Robert and I were uh, driving through somewhere this week in Gastonia or Belmont, we happened to come up on a stoplight and the car in front of us had a, a Bible in the back window. I love that. In, in my generation, everybody kept their Bible in the back window. And then pages were all frayed and it was all bowed up from being in the sun, being hot, being cold, dusty, whatever. But I wonder if the Word of God stays on the back window of our car, how zealous we are to know what it says. I'm not throwing shade, as the young folks say. I'm just asking a question. How zealous are you for the Scriptures and applying them to your life? Number three, you should be zealous to love others. You should be zealous. There should be some vigor and some energy in loving others. It's about relationship. First with Him and then with all of you. That's why we do Men's ministry on Saturday mornings. That's why the women gather to do Bible studies. That's why we have connect groups that meet throughout the week because we are about relationship primarily with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and secondly, with each other. But we should pursue those relationships. We shouldn't wait for them to come and hit us on the head. We should be going after the people that we don't know to find out who they are, where they're at with their walk with Christ. And get to know them in a different way. We've got to be zealous to love other people. We should be serving others. We talked about this a week or so ago. We should be pursuing ways in which we can serve one another. What is the need? My son Corey put us onto a television show by the name of New Amsterdam. Anybody seeing that? I don't usually get into a, a, a show and watch it episode after episode, but the main character doctor on that show asks almost everybody that he comes into contact with, how can I help? I love the heart in that. When is the last time you met somebody and without knowing their whole story and how deep you were going to have to get in, you just simply said, how can I help? What's going on in your life? When's the last time you called a brother or a sister that you just felt like God had put on your heart and said, hey, I'm thinking about you today. How can I help? What's going on? What do you need? Do we need to have coffee? Do I need to come babysit the kids? We should be zealous about serving others. Jesus modeled this for us and commanded us to do it. Number five. And we were this morning already this. We should be zealous for the Holy Spirit of God. Now, there's a lot of churches out there that don't want to talk about that. They're not going to bring that up. But there should be a pursuit in the follower of Jesus Christ's life that says, I need the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of me and to dwell inside of me and to grow inside of me and to lead me and to comfort me and to give me strength. 
Where's your zeal for the Holy Spirit of God? He's our guide, the scriptures tell us. He's our comfort. He's our strength. And he is available to every one of us. There's no one excluded. The follower of Christ, the disciple of Christ, has access to the Holy Spirit of God. You are not left out. Also, as kingdom participants, we find out in the scripture that we're under the command to pray for the kingdom of heaven to come to pass. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives us the model as he did the disciples of how to pray. And he says these words, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom Come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was teaching the disciples and teaching us, when you pray, pray that the kingdom of heaven will come to pass. We're commanded to do so. We're modeled to do so. And then on down in verse 33 of that same chapter, the, Jesus commands, seek ye first, what? The kingdom of heaven. I don't seek my profession first. No. No. I don't seek my mate first, my spouse. The, no, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And it continues and says, as some of us know, all of the rest of the stuff will be added unto you. So what is this kingdom all about? As we start this series on Sunday mornings called Upside Down Kingdom, what, what is this kingdom all about. After all, the, the kingdom that Jesus came and talked about when he was on the earth was not the kingdom that the people that were there, first century church, were looking for. He, he didn't come and present the kingdom that they wanted. The, the folks that were already on the scene, the Jews, were looking for a Messiah that would bring a kingdom that would elevate them above the Roman oppression, above the, the Roman Empire. They anticipated a king, a deliverer. Someone who would come and bring a kingdom that would lead them in a successful liberation from the persecution of the Romans. They wanted the Romans thrown out. They wanted to have dominion and kingdom themselves, and that's the king and the kingdom they were looking for. Some of the religious folks of that time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they believed that because of careful investigation that they would be the first ones to discover the promised Savior in this kingdom. That's what they were looking for. But instead of a, all of that, they, they got a message of freedom from Jesus. They got a message of humbleness, of serving, of giving, of dying, of repentance. And that's not what they were looking for. My fear is that it may, in fact, be that that's not the kingdom we're looking for. Could in fact be that we've kind of built up our own image and our own idea of what kingdom we're looking for. But Jesus didn't come to bring about the kingdom we want. He came to bring about his kingdom. As we see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus introduced, described, and promised a very different kingdom. He promised and, and brought about a kingdom that that when it comes, it will never end. Who's thankful for that this morning? It's not a kingdom that we'll see the king or the leader voted out of office and a new group come in. It is a kingdom that will never end. It is a kingdom that will include every person who will believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it will exclude any person who will reject and deny that message. That is not a popular viewpoint. It will include every person who will believe and accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it will exclude every person who rejects that message. The kingdom is very, very much upside down from what the Jews expected. And from what the world system teaches us today. Here's some things that we know about God's kingdom. I found these in Matthew chapter 5. Most of your Bibles will list that section as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. 
First one says, as seeing the multitudes, he, being Jesus, went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then it says, then he opened his mouth and taught them. He opened his mouth and taught them. I thought it very interesting why in the world they would put that in there. Why did the Why did Matthew write that into the scriptures that he opened his mouth? It's because there's other ways to teach people. Amen. There's other ways that people learn things. He opened his mouth and he taught them saying this, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That teaches us that we know that there will be people that are poor in spirit in heaven. What does that mean? In other words, it means people who have realized at some point in their life that they're spiritually bankrupt. They can't do it without God. They're poor in spirit. And Jesus taught that heaven will be full of people who are poor in spirit. He continues and says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. We know by reading that, that the kingdom of heaven will be full of people who were weeping at some point. They were sad. There was something going on that caused them much grief, but they will be comforted. Heaven will be full of people who were weeping at one point and found comfort in God's kingdom. He continues and said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is gentleness and humility. God's kingdom will be full of people who are meek and mild-tempered. He continues and says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled I love this because it means that there are people who have a hunger and a thirst and they go after righteousness, things that are right and upstanding, things of the kingdom, things of God, things of heaven. And this says that the kingdom of heaven will be filled with people who were pursuing God, just as we were moments ago. It'd be filled with that. We know heaven will will look like that. He continues and says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God's kingdom will be full of people who didn't deserve, but they accepted and received God's mercy. They should have received the punishment for their sins, but they didn't. They received instead God's mercy. That's what the kingdom of heaven will look like. He continues and says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. These are people that had pure hearts pure intentions. They went after their ministry areas and and serving people and knowing the scripture and loving folks with a pure heart, not with motives of self-gain and selfishness, but pure heart. They'll be all over God's kingdom. He continues and says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. God's kingdom will be full of people who sought to make peace with everybody. That's not easy. But everywhere they went, in every family situation, every work situation, every time things got a little heated, these were people who found a way to make peace, even to those who despitefully used them. And he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, we know, will be full of people who were persecuted for Christ's sake. They were kicked down. Some of them martyred and died. Some of them lived their entire lives in financial ruin. Whatever that persecution is, there will be people in heaven that were persecuted, not for their own sake, but for righteousness' sake. Then I read over in chapter 13 of Matthew and goes on in chapters 20 and 25 that Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven like this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field. Then in the next few verses, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man sowed in his field. Then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven or or yeast, which a woman took and hid. Then he says that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, which a man found and hid. Then Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet or or, or a fishing net that's cast into the sea. 
He goes on and says that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who, who went out to hire workers for his vineyard. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who arranged a wedding for his son and then sent for those who were invited and they would not come. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered goods to them. What does all of that mean? How do we take all of those parables and the kingdom of heaven is like and make a determination and figure out what is this kingdom? I don't have the answer for you. We could analyze each one of them and we could read commentary and we could think and pray and ponder and God would hopefully reveal through his Holy Spirit something to us and all that. But here's the bottom line. We can't understand everything about the kingdom of heaven. We get some glimpse of the kingdom of heaven as John writes to us in the book of Revelation and what the physical components of walls and streets may look like, but we can't understand with our mortal minds this kingdom of heaven that Jesus came to bring to pass. But here's what I do know. Jesus offers for me and for you to be a part of it. He says, if you'll receive me, make me Lord of your life, you are in the kingdom of heaven. And you will help bring it to pass. So listen to the qualifications of being in the kingdom. The first one is you must be born again. This threw people in the Bible. When Jesus said you must be born again, their minds immediately went to the point where they were born. Although they don't remember that, but we've all seen pictures of us as tiny babies and heard stories of how it was. And how many hours of labor our mothers had to go through to bring us here. And how our fathers will take us out if we don't listen. But Jesus said that's not it at all. It's not to be born physically again. But to be born and that's the next thing. To be born of water and spirit is a qualification to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Not to be born physically again. But to be reborn of water and spirit. It also says that you must be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. And sometimes we read that qualification and say, no problem, check the box, be careful. We have to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. We know from reading in Scripture, the scribes and the Pharisees were very selfish. And they were in it for their own personal gain and to make sure that their rulership and leadership didn't diminish, their position didn't diminish. We cannot be sexually immoral. We cannot be impure. We cannot be idolatrous. We cannot be adulterers. We cannot be practicing homosexuality. We cannot be thieves. We cannot be greedy. We cannot be drunkards. We cannot be revelers, meaning speak of others with contempt or abusive language. We cannot be swindlers, meaning cheaters. We cannot be practicing sorcery. We cannot be bringing enmity or hatred or hostility to situations. We cannot be bringing strife. We cannot be jealous. We cannot have fits of anger. We cannot cause dissension in our families and in our relationships. We cannot bring division. We cannot be envious people. We cannot be living in drunkenness. And Paul continues in that list and says, and things like these. We shouldn't leave that out. Because if you can go through and check all the boxes and say, I got everything covered, then when Paul gets to, and things like these, sometimes you have to pause. Paul writes these things that I mentioned to the Galatians. And he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those, things who, those people who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then to top all of that off, I got to a passage in Luke chapter 17, and in my Bible it's subtitled, The Coming of the Kingdom. The Coming of the Kingdom. It says, starting with verse 20, Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. 
Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. That blew me away this week when I read that. So is the kingdom already here or is the kingdom coming? Both. Then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days that the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. He was talking about false teachers and prophets. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part and under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. What does that mean? It means when he comes, he's coming in an instant, in a flash. No one will be standing there going, is that somebody? Is this coming? What's happening here? And it'll be public. It will be for every eye to see and every ear to hear. It will be a very public day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected to this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, he continues, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not come back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. By the way, that's the message for today. That verse, 33. That whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in the night there will be two men in bed and one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together and one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field and one will be taken and the other Left And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Wherever the body is, then the eagles will be gathered together. That's nice and clear, isn't it? The upside down kingdom of God, the, this thing that we sometimes feel like we have a little hold on, but yet the more we dig in and the more we study and the more we hear from God through his Holy Spirit, the more confused I get. What is this kingdom? How is this kingdom? When is this kingdom? Where is this kingdom? But we know again that we are part of this upside down Kingdom. This kingdom is not easy to comprehend. There's a lot to it, and we have just scratched the surface, just digging in to find out the things that we can read and know about in the kingdom of heaven. But here's what I want to send you away with today. And this is plainly, just as plainly as I know how to say it to us. You will spend eternity in one of two kingdoms. You will either spend eternity in the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that this world has to offer. You will spend eternity in death and darkness and confusion and pain and agony. Or you can spend eternity in God's kingdom. You may not understand everything about it. It might not be just as plain as the back of your hand. But you can spend eternity in God's kingdom where there is life where there is healing, where there is mercy, where there is grace, where there is peace and comfort and God's love that we sang about, you can spend eternity there. God, in his master plan for your life and my life, has given us the privilege to make that choice. So my question is simply, where will you spend eternity? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? It's a really simple question. And, and we don't have to have all the components of what the kingdom is or 
when the kingdom's coming or if it's already here. We don't have to know all of that to have the faith to believe that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is near. This series on the upside down kingdom is going to reveal to us over the course of the next few weeks the things that the kingdom of heaven teaches that are contrary to this world. The things that the kingdom of heaven and Jesus came to teach that don't make any sense. They're not common sense. They're upside down. But what I wanted to spend this Sunday making sure of is that we are all in the kingdom. There's nothing that could be more important than making sure you're in the kingdom. Well, how in the world would I know that, Pastor? You have to know and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's that simple. I read another passage as I was flipping through Matthew and Mark and Luke this week where the little children were trying to get to Jesus and the disciples said, no, 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 get them off of him. And Jesus stopped them and said, you let those little children come to me. And it broke my heart, not maybe for the reason you think, but what broke my heart was the fact that the disciples, as learned as they were and as much time as they had hung out with Jesus, they didn't think he would want them there. As a dad this morning, as a grandfather this morning, I can tell you most assuredly, you want them there. He wants you there. And he said in that passage, to his disciples and to those that were listening you let those little children come for such is the kingdom of heaven that a little child would come and be able to understand their desire for Jesus I just felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up because that's the desperation that he calls to every one of us with He shoes off all the stuff of the world and all the people who are in our ear going, yeah, I don't even know if that's for real. You you probably shouldn't do that. They're just teaching a bunch of garbage over there. Listen to me this morning. Jesus is waiting for you. He wants you with a desperation to come and just crawl up on his lap today and love on him while he loves on you. And so I'm giving you the opportunity. Many of you have sat in church for years and years and years, and that may not mean a thing this morning. You may not know Jesus. See, this is a physical action that takes place and a, a calendar event that shows up on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. And, 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 and that doesn't mean you're going to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Being a good person won't get you there. Following the rules won't get you there. A relationship with Jesus Christ will get you there. So what do you have to do? Simple. You have to mean it, feel it, down deep in the soul of who you are. And understand at this moment you are a sinner in need of a Savior. That there is a great chasm, there's a division between you and this kingdom that I talked about and this Savior. And you can't do anything about it. You remember that scripture we read at the very beginning? It said that we have been conveyed from the darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You can't do it on your own. You don't have the power inside of you to convey yourself. But he's here this morning to convey you. So it's simple. Is there anybody here this morning that would raise their hand, be bold enough to say, I need to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. No one's looking around but me. Just raise your hand and say, Pastor, don't forget about me in this final prayer. Anybody at all? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Thank you. Thank you. 
Praise God. He's working on people. He's created this moment, this moment this morning for you. I'm going to ask you to take that next step. And I'm going to ask you to come down here. I want to pray with you. I want to make sure that you know you're sure and that you have been conveyed this morning. So I'm going to ask you now, just get up and walk down here. I need to, I need to pray with you, Pastor. Pastor Terry's going to come. Joseph's going to come. We want to pray with you. We want to make sure there's nothing else that can be more important in this moment. There's nothing else in this whole world that's as important as this moment. Let's just all stand all across the room. I understand the hesitation. I've been there. I, I, I know it. I want to pray for all of us. Because whether we are today or were at some point, we have all needed to to make a commitment and to be conveyed, amen? Heavenly Father, Jesus, my Savior, thank you for conveying me into your kingdom. Thank you for making yourself clear to me this morning. God, I thank you for the the hands that only I saw and you saw go up. Because what you're doing is you're doing something inside of their heart that is supernatural. You're doing something that's beyond our knowledge and ability to comprehend. You're changing a person from what they are to what you've called them to be. So God, I I pray that as I'm praying that they're also praying, that they're talking to you, that they're building a relationship with you and that that they would confess to you, God, their sins this morning. It's just between you and them that they would acknowledge right now their need for a Savior, their deficiency, their their spiritually unable to, to do this on their own. They need you, Jesus, to come and to fill that void and create that bridge that carries them over that chasm that's there between them and God the Father. And so I thank you, God, this morning. I know you're doing a work. I know your spirit has moved here this morning. I have felt it. I still feel it. I know that you are capable, God, this morning of not only saving people from their sins, but healing people that desperately need a healing touch. There are people that came here this morning thinking they needed a job. God, I know and you know what they need is the Holy Spirit. There are people that came here this morning thinking that they needed a a better relationship with a person on this planet. I know and you know this morning what they need right now is your Holy Spirit. There are people that came here this morning that are desperate to just understand where they need to be in their lives. They have no direction and they're floundering. What they need is your Holy Spirit to come and fill them once again. I'm going to ask this. If you would just like the Holy Spirit to be fresh and new on you, will you come join me down here this morning? Just move in this direction. You just want the Holy Spirit to refill you, refresh you, renew you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you raised your hand earlier and this is a moment where you need to know Christ, I'm giving you that opportunity again to come down here and and let us pray with you and, and make sure and give you guidance. I'm going to give 15, 20 more seconds because God's moving on somebody still. He won't let me close this out until he's done. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
We need to just raise our hands and ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill us. Because that's what we all need, regardless of our need, regardless of what's on the list this morning. It's all the same. We need His Holy Spirit. So just ask Him this morning. Just, just ask Him to give you His Holy Spirit. Lord God, my Father, I ask You to send a fresh and a new dose of Your Holy Spirit to these people this morning. God, whatever it is that they need, whatever it is that, that You know and only You know, fill them this morning, God, with Your Holy Spirit. Bring them peace and comfort. Bring them salvation, God, this morning. In the midst of whatever it is that, that they're dealing with, Heavenly Father, I just ask and I believe and I know that You will do it. God, You are our healer, our protector, our Savior. All things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' precious name. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Praise Your holy name, God. Praise Your holy name. He's here. He's here. Talk to Him. Tell Him what you need. Tell him, in Jesus precious name. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for tuning in to this week's message. For more information, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.